All right, all right. We'll get it started in just a minute. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We got folks coming in. Andrew, Anthony, Brian, Cole. Awesome. Glad you guys are here. We'll get started in just a minute. Dave, you want to start my video? Uh, hang on a second. I will get you cooking, man. My big man. Let's sit here. Let's get you going. I got to upgrade you to... There you are. Now you should be able to start your video. Awesome. Joe, you made it. That's I'm good here. news. So uh, for those of you from NASA, I am honoring everybody from NASA. I got my, I need my mug. I mean, I need my space mug. So welcome everybody from NASA. Good, good, good. 52 people already, man. Fantastic. This is absolutely one of the one of the hottest topics that we've talked about recently so i'm glad you guys are here to help us out laszlo and joe joe go make sure your cameras are okay everything looks right to me glad to be here awesome fantastic well, we'll get cooking we got we got a bunch of folks i think there's over 200 people that registered so it is a hot topic welcome everybody so uh let us know where you are, who you are, where you're coming from. I'm coming in from uh, Woodstock, Maryland. For those of you who don't have any idea where that is, if you know where CMS is and you know where Columbia is, we're right smack in between that in the in the countryside. That's where Woodstock is. I'll pop that into the to the chat. So Woodstock is where I'm coming from. Let us know where you guys are. Kip from FAA Seattle. Love it, love it. Welcome, Kip. So I saw some interesting thing in the news with uh, FAA with 5G, and I'm not sure what all that is. We might have to do a briefing on that whole thing. Maybe somebody can pick us up. Charleston, Jeff from Charleston. Love it. We have Deborah from Chicago. You guys are from Chicago, right, Laszlo? Yeah. Awesome. Mike from Springville. Awesome. Karen Earl from DL. How you doing, Carol? Karen, good to see you. I think you were in you were in the one a couple of weeks ago too. So fantastic. Glad to, you guys made it. And the only people that would know Catonsville, Maryland. There you go. That's near me, Warren. That's awesome. Chris, Kate May, Albert, Delaware. Love it. Fantastic. We'll go ahead and go. We'll get ourselves started here. Welcome to the Zero Trust Adoption. In federal government, the Zero Trust Architecture, we're glad you decided to join us. You can go ahead and flip that screen there, Laszlo. Normally, I'm driving, <laughs> but Laszlo's driving today because he's doing he's doing a lot of the questions. He's actually going to be the host of this. So welcome, everybody. We, we have so many folks from various agencies joining us today, and those who aren't joining us are going to be getting the recording, so that'll be awesome. So you have that, but we really want to welcome everybody that decided to join us. I, I know there's a bunch of folks from the VA, a bunch of folks from, from CMS, uh, and, and DHS was all over the place in this. So we really appreciate you guys joining us, and, and we do want to welcome you. And real quick, go ahead, Laszlo. This will be the best briefing ever. Al says from HHS, explains the methodology. I think we're going to get to that, right? Right, Joe? Yep. Yeah, buddy, we're going to get to that. Wilbert says, gain an overview of what Zero Trust is all about. Again, looking at what it is. So Matthew from FAA, I better understand the mandate and why this mandate will work versus the cloud mandate that never happened. Woo all right, Matthew. Just causing a little trouble there, Matthew. Uh, Sandra from the VA, I gain an understanding of whether ZTA is a concept framework process. What is this thing? Love it. Douglas, I understand the advantage and pitfalls of implementation. Absolutely. We'll get into some of that, I do believe. Brian from DHS and ICE, it is informative and not a sales pitch. You hear me, Joe? No selling. No selling. Got it. No selling. No selling. <laughs> Carter uh, from USGS, uh, there are actionable items from it. Hopefully, we're going to have some actionable items, right, gentlemen? Yes, sir. And then Conrad from CMS, it emphasized what published mandates support zero trust implementation. Absolutely, we're going to get to that part, I do believe. So go to the next one here, Laszlo. Please address this. Dennis from the Navy, define what the heck this ZTA is. And uh, from BD, I don't know what that stands for, but BD knows who he is or she is. How zero trust differs from traditional security. Love it. James from Treasury, how 
do other functions like vulnerability management fit in? Woo. And how to operate the idea of ZTA. Love that. Jeff from our, the Air Force, thank you for your service. How does your implementation differ from the one that must include foreign partner nations? Wow, that's a pretty good one, right? That is. That's a winner. Daryl from the VA, I can understand what Zero Trust adds value to my agency. I love it. Uh, Robin, also from the Air Force, thank you for your service. Uh, impact to acquisitions, impact to industry and contractors, another great place. So she's coming from the acquisition side and making sure that this flows down right through the systems. Right, Kevin from the VA, where can we get share best practices and ZTA implementations? Hopefully, we're going to do a little bit about that here, right, guys? Yes, sure. All right. Uh, and Larry, with uh, with BLS, the impact of Executive Order 1014. 1428 and OMB's draft strategy and open source. I like that too. Is there another one on the bottom of that? I thought there was one. We're missing one there. There was one that was my favorite one. And it is Robert from the VA. Who watches the watcher watching the watchers? That was one of my favorites. Love that. All right. So with that, go ahead to the next one. I'm going to introduce these guys that, that are here for you uh, today. First, we have Joe Norton. He's a senior fellow for digital security and risk. You can see his information here. Uh, he is also the qualified qualified Techn technology executive for Digital Directors Network. He's the founder of Project Management Institute Executive Council in Chicago, the Chief Customer Satisfaction and Quality Officer, and Senior VP of Atos Worldwide. These are all the places that he's he serves. Chief Security Officer, Chief Tech. Technology Officer, Head of Operations at Phillips. He's also worked with Novartis as a Chief Technology Officer and Senior VP. He is an executive in, res in residence at McKinsey and Company. He's a lecturer at Kellogg School of Management and United States Navy Submarine Service. Thank you for your service, Joe Norton. Appreciate that. And we also have Laszlo Gonk. He's going to be taking the reins on this and asking some questions, but he's, he's also going to participate, we hope. He's the founder. Uh, he's the first senior fellow for Divine's Digital Risk and Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. He's also the founder and senior fellow of Divine uh, and, and uh, of uh, Security and Risk, Qualified Technology ex Executive for Digital Directors Network. He's the chair emeritus, emeritus, uh, Project Management Institute Executive Council in Chicago. He's a member of the FBI InfraGuard in Chicago. Appreciate that service. A member of Forbes Technology Council, Senior Advisor for National Secure Security Collaborative. He's a board member of ISACA Chicago, a board member of SIM Chicago, and IITC Squared Safe Advisory Board member in IIT. These are some guys that know security. I do believe, ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate you guys being here. And, and uh, if you can go to the next one, Laszlo. So today, we're, I'll give you a little bit of an overview of the uh, did the introductions for these guys and, and who they are, but we're also introduced to Vine and who Divine is. Uh, so what is zero trust architecture in federal government and what it isn't? More importantly, what it is not. And the federal mandates, we're a lot of folks asking that, and the initiatives on zero trust and the areas where agencies need to make progress by 2024 and some of the pitfalls and traps that you see in zero trust. Go ahead to the next one. You will have session docs coming in right now. Terry, I think you're going to pop those in for us. Those are coming. You'll have the briefing presentation, the handout, and, and ZTA's capabilities. And the next one. Uh, if you've been living under a rock and you don't know what how Zoom works, you can go up to that, the briefing controls up top and you can see things side by side. You can make us bigger or smaller, whatever you would like to have your presentation experience be awesome. Go to the next one. And finally, participating is very easy. You can raise your hand. If you have questions, let's put that in the Q&A. If you want to tell us something about yourself, put that in the chat. And if you, if you, uh, we'll be glad to be to share this with whoever wants it. So uh, let us know who you are and, and what you do in the chat. But if you have questions, pop those in the Q and A or raise your hand, and we'll make sure we can, uh, we'll unmute you and make sure that you can have the dialogue. If you would like to communicate offline, send the information here to S G O V I L K A R at divine D I V I H N 
Com, or you can call the number 847-909-3040 and that'll take you offline and you can address those things there. And now I'm going to introduce you to uh, Divine. Go ahead to the next one, please. Uh, well, oh, first this, a disclaimer. You're not going to believe this. This comes from GSA Legal. This event is not affiliated or endorsed by GSA or any other agency. It's provided to you for informational purposes only. And any participation in this briefing is voluntary by you engaging it is not an endorsement to, com to, to or commitment to purchase from any vendor, including Divine. And that means you guys can communicate through this in their agency briefing. Go to the next one. So we will be asking some polls as far as we do this. And today we're, we're gonna ask why in the world did you guys decide to join us here today? You're in management, you want your data to work. This is not the right thing. We're gonna end that poll because that is not the right poll. So tell us why you are here today and we'll make sure we get a poll up that, that is working the way it should. So why are you here today? Are you, are, you wanna know about zero trust? Whatever it is, you can let us know in the chat and we'll make sure we get your information. If you have any questions, you can pop that into your, uh, wanna learn about, Robert says, wanna learn about zero trust. Fantastic, let us know what you have as well, and we'll continue to the next thing. Go ahead um, and change this. A Little bit about Divine. Uh, I'm gonna tell you that these, these folks are located uh, just out, just around Chicago, right? You guys in the Chicago area. And you create value through, through your enterprise cloud and on-premises solutions and reusable IP. What is reusable IP and intellectual property? What does that mean, gents? Can somebody answer that one for me? Sure, everyone. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Reusable IP means that our original IP that we apply methodologies, et cetera, or solutions are basically, when we work with clients, is reusable for you. You can apply it. Um, you know, it's not just isolated just to us. So if you work with us as a company, uh, reusable IP says, hey, it's yours to use as free as you want whenever we're done. And basically their forms, their templates, their worksheets, uh, things that you can use in your business processes and workflows. Love it. And now your active contributor in the community, we mentioned that with your, with your background for both of you gentlemen, uh, FBI InfraGuard, National, 911. Uh, we love that. We appreciate you guys doing that. And you're often invited to speak kind of like this, guys, to many industry conferences and, and nonprofits. Founded in 2002 in Illinois. And you are an SBA 8A certified. When did you get your 8A and how long is it good for? I think that might be a question for Harold. Her Harold, when, when, when did you guys get that? We got it in uh, just, ju just last June. Just last June, so yep. fantastic. So, so you're gonna be an 8A for quite a while. Fantastic, we appreciate you guys doing that. And Laszlo Gonk is gonna take it from here. I'm gonna go ahead and disappear and stop okay. my video. All so right, go thank, ahead, you. thank you so much for that introduction, Dave. Glad to be here, glad to be with all of you. So we're gonna start. Joe, how do we actually start this conversation? Well, you start the conference, it reminds me of, um, you know, some of the old adages about being the bug of the windshield, right? And, uh, but I like to turn that around a little bit and say, hey, listen, you start the conversation by adopting a mental framework that says, listen, I want to be the eagle or the fish. It's that simple. Now, this little graphic we popped up here, believe it or not, that's actually one of my photographs I had the uh, great fortune to capture uh, just before Thanksgiving in Maryland on the Susquehanna River, believe it or not, at the Conowingo Dam. But uh, you may be looking at ZTA, Zero Trust, as an architecture or a process or a methodology and a way of working with security and saying, oh my God, what is this? Am I going to get bowled over by this or am I going to be the eagle and take charge here? Okay. So Joe, you're going to get down for us how, why are we here? So basically, I think we all know that we hear, uh, you know, following back in, in uh, May last year, uh, the White House's uh, executive order on proving the nation's security, followed in September by OMB's strategy for moving our U.S. government and our federal 
uh, civilian executive agencies toward a zero trust architecture, okay? Which leads us to today. Now we're here in January uh, for this briefing about zero trust ar architecture. What is this executive order all about? So executive order 14028 actually came out as we said in May and it has nine chapters in it. And the one we're focusing on today is about zero trust architecture is in chapter three, modernizing the federal government cybersecurity of which there's multiple components. But the executive order also addresses everything related to fostering a more secure cyberspace in federal government, removing barriers for information sharing, supply chain security, software supply chain security, which is not just software, it's also your platform suppliers, et cetera. Review boards, uh, standardizing the playbooks for vulnerabilities and incident responses and sharing and timeliness, et cetera. Um, in, in, responses and remediations as we go forward. But today we're not going to address all of this, which is we're gonna focus on the zero trust architecture. Okay, so focusing, what are the federal agency cybersecurity initiatives? Well, across the executive order and OMB's guidance is a focus on best practices, achieving over time a zero trust architecture, accelerating movement to cloud services, which is part of modernization, but there's a, a trap in, in cloud services I'll talk about a little bit later, centralizing and streamlining how you communicate cybersecurity information, especially in real time, driving using and using analytics uh, to understand cybersecurity risks, and more importantly, the piece that I was very happy to see after all of these years is investing in technology and personnel so that you could get there. Now, there's some very specific goals from OMB that says, hey, listen, implementation plans for uh, uh, fiscal year 22 to 24, budget estimates for 23 to 24, or, or the upfront stages that you're working on, reprioritizing your current funding for fiscal 22 to address these imperatives and in participating in the continuous diagnostic and mitigation programs from DHS for cybersecurity. And it's kind of interesting. I always hear questions about, well, how much is this gonna cost? How big is this thing? And, you know, looking at some of the, the most recent information across the federal agency CIO office, um, fiscal 21, 22 to 23, um, going into 23, the preliminary budget data that I've seen uh, going into OMB is showing a $1.2 billion increase in funding requests. Now, that's not equal across all the agencies, obviously, but this is a big deal. All right. So we know why we're here. That's great. But what exactly is zero trust? Well, I saw one of the questions up front, uh, which was, uh, what is this? Is it a concept? Is it, is it something, et cetera? It's all of these things. But zero trust is defined in NIST uh, SP 800 uh, is a collection of concepts, ideas designed to minimize uncertainty and enforce least privilege per request access decisions. Now, I slowed down when I said that because I want to highlight this, because this is very important about moving from, you know, um, you know, a lot of the current practices in security towards zero trust. Least privilege per request access decisions. So this leads from a design perspective to start thinking about moving away from single sign-on, et cetera, uh, as well. All right. So if that is what that is, is there anything <laughs> that zero trust is not? Well, is a lot of things zero trust isn't. So when you start with saying concepts and moving to reality, um, zero trust, it's not a product. No matter what anybody else out there may be, may be saying or thinking or looking at or hoping or, or whatever it is, you cannot go to Home Depot or Lowell's and buy a box of zero trust. It doesn't exist. There's lots of components to get you to a zero trust architecture. So it's not a COTS solution. 
Zero trust will also not stop bad actors from trying to penetrate your networks and steal your data and stop your operations. So it's definitely not a solution to zero day vulnerabilities. And zero trust is not cloud adoption. Cloud adoption is cloud adoption. It's just shifting from premises data centers to, you know, to off premises data centers and third parties to supply those services uh, as infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, whatever. But just moving your agency to cloud does not get you directly to zero trust. And a big part of the executive order in the section on software and supply chains includes platforms and cloud, et cetera, is the extensions of zero trust architecture throughout the IT supply chains. So your suppliers have different mandates under the executive order to achieve zero trust also. You just cannot depend on going to a cloud supplier and saying, hey, I got a cloud, I'm, I'm done, I'm golden. That is not true. The other thing to think about and worry about with just pure cloud adoption is that just because you may uh, contract with a cloud supplier, whoever that may be, I don't wanna name them all here, you know who they are, doesn't mean you have an employee of that company running your cloud administration. Trust me, I was the chief security officer at Atos worldwide, and we had massive contracts to provide cloud administrative services for all of the big cloud suppliers, including Microsoft and, and Google and others. So you, it, it, zero trust ultimately needs to extend not just to your primary suppliers, but to their subcontractors and their sub-tier suppliers also. And the last thing I want to I'd want i like to highlight is that zero trust will not make you recovery ready. It will not stop cyber attacks. It will not stop 100% breaches. And it has, it's not going to make you recovery ready. That is a completely different aspect of your security posture. Okay, so we learned why we're here. We learned that zero trust is about, at one of its core tenants is enforcing least privilege per request access. We learned at a high level what zero trust is not. And it's definitely not a shoebox solution. It's a concept. So Joe, where do we start? Well, you start with the philosophy and the culture behind what an architecture tells you it should be. And I truly mean that. You have to adopt a mindset, or well, you don't have to, but I suggest that it's like governance and philosophy and a culture around least privilege access per request. Okay, so I still that need a little- short, but that is really where you start. Still, leave, I still need a little more, Joe. So what are the core principles of zero trust? <laughs> so behind that, I was gonna say is, that's the easy part. You want to achieve it, okay? The core principles behind zero trust is a model for securing your devices, your applications, your networks, your data, and your identity. And it's again, focused on identity centric policies as a model for controlling access. And the core principles start with three pertinent aspects, right? Ensure all your resources are accessed securely regardless of location, wherever they may be in the world. Adopt a least privileged strategy and strictly enforce access control and inspect and log all traffic to see that it is being adhered to. This is the important part. And this principle about, I thought I saw a, a, a one of the inputs when we started was about, well, what, what about other partner nations or agencies we may work with, especially out of the military? Least privileged strategy, strictly enforced, regardless of where access requests come from. Okay. So this sounds like it's going to take some time. Are oh. there any specific timelines that need to be addressed? Well, reaching zero trust architecture is a, an endeavor that's been developed across uh, our federal government, across all of your security agencies. And CISA directives and timeframes recommendations are that it's a long journey in a relatively short time frame with some specific goals to be achieved by the end of Q3 or the end of September in 2024. And very specifically, some of the things that are called out in the executive order, as well as in the OMB guidance is at the identity level, 
least privilege access, enterprise-wide, know who all your access requests and users are, and multi-factor identification. Complete inventory of your devices and infrastructures if you're not already there, and the ability to detect and respond to incidents. Um, at the network level and infrastructure level, it specifically addresses and calls for encryption at rest and encryption in transit for all your data. And for your applications that you run your agency with, your business systems, they must all be treated as if they are internet connected and tested with external vulnerability testing. And then on the data side, have at least a pathway for data protection, categorization, logging of information, et cetera. Hmm. You've given us some good information, a lot of points that we need to address in this relatively challenging time frame. Is there anything else we need to be paying attention to? Well, maybe not considered specifically zero trust, but the CISA directives also address our, our uh, threat hunting aspects by CISA. So Public Law 116.283, CISA hunting and activities to be embraced by all federal uh, civilian executive agencies um, without prior authorization. So CISA is being directed by executive order to test your networks. And they don't have to give you fair warning that they're doing it, but they will provide you the reports and provide reports in conjunction with your cells at your agency reporting to uh, the assistance of the president for national security, as well as to OMB. Okay, uh, Dave, I am punting to you. You're on mute, Dave. There we go, I'm back. <laughs> All right, uh, so yeah, that was, that was really, really good information. Uh, I'm really impressed by the timeline of uh, that, that you're, that, that we have to, uh, that we have to meet. Um, so this this uh, next poll is what is your biggest issue with, with zero trust? Is it just understanding what it is? Because that's part of this process. Is it meeting the presidential memorandum? Is it what is this? How does this impact your agency? What about your job role? Is, is, do you have a concern about your job role? Or is it finding resources? So we'll, we'll keep that open for just a minute. And uh, Karen has her hand raised. Um, We'll, we'll we'll probably we'll get to Karen. Karen, we'll get to you when we get to the end. Is that okay with you guys, or to, to do that? And if you have any additional questions, if you have questions on, on anything that 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 was put out there by by Joe or Laszlo, uh, pop that in the Q and A, and we'll make sure we get that at, at the end as well. All right. So with that, we're going to keep that running. You go ahead, and we'll start start talking about some of those challenges. And and what what zero trust is, and we'll, I'll keep this open for a couple, probably about another thirty seconds, and I'll shut it down. But you go ahead, take it back over, Laszlo, and we'll keep rolling. Okay. So Joe, we're going to follow that up with: Are there any specific challenges that you would highlight? <laughs> so, so list it, is long. <laughs> yeah, it is a long list. But you know, when you first look at anything like this, everything's a challenge. I mean, this is just experience. There's so many pieces to this and saying, oh my God, this is huge. Are we really going to do this, et cetera? So, I mean, you can go through the list, you, you know, uh, you know, implicit trust versus zero trust. So one of the questions I saw earlier on in the beginning was, hey, what's different from what we're doing today to tomorrow? And it really is today, you know, the, the best practices in security that have been adopted worldwide are implicit trust. You log in, we trust you. Zero trust takes you to change, you know, testing um, for trust for every access request. Okay, um, it, it focuses on the modernization side of while you want to implement zero trust, you're rebuilding and replacing with cloud. It requires massive investments, people training skills. I mentioned, can you trust your suppliers or not? I, I let me highlight. There's no specific adopted one size fits all in federal government or anywhere in the world from a maturity model, but there is guidance in health, okay? It is a large multi-year program, there's no doubt, and I'll talk later about complexity and portfolios and portfolios of programs and project and works to do and reporting requirements, et cetera. Um, and the other one to pay attention to uh, from a modernization perspective is the idea of flat networks versus micro segmentation. Okay. And I already highlighted no single sign on. 
Uh, it all looks like challenges. When you first look at it, it's like, oh my God, what do I do? But I will tell you that this is not a technology challenge. It's a logistical challenge to address what the intent of zero trust is over time. It's a management, it's a planning, it's a communication and a coordination challenge. It's not necessarily a technical challenge. Thanks, Joe. That, that really helps at least lay out the groundwork for the next uh, half of this presentation. But before we go to the next slide, Dave, I'm gonna let you talk to the results that we got from our poll. I'm sharing it on the screen now. Fantastic, love it. And um, are you sharing those? You want me to share the polls? Is that what you want me to do? Um, is, it, is it showing up on my screen share? I'll, I'll, I'll share it. Okay. I'm sharing it out. All right, so a lot of, lot of feedback here. Great, I really appreciate that from everybody here. And um, obviously, you can see where they are with the impact on their agency, the impact on the job role, all of those, understanding it. And that's why we're here. Thank you for, for doing that and making sure that, uh, okay. that we know what's important to you. Right, guys? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. All right, uh, Joe, we're about at the halfway point and about okay. eight, and 18 minutes into our core presentation of the conversation. So is there anything good to be found in these challenges? Always. There's always something good. There's always opportunity. I've, I've coached my, 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 my people, my staff, the companies I've been a member and an officer for, et cetera, over time, that no matter what you look at up front, no matter how bad things may look at or complicated, they're never as good as or as bad as they first appear. There's always a path through what may seem daunting. And it's just a matter of planning it out and stepping through it one step at a time. Things are never as good as or as bad as they first appear. It's that simple. Hmm. All right. Well, does zero trust stand alone? Or no, I will. It. Go ahead. No, there's a lot. Of, forgive me for jumping in. It's just I get really excited about this stuff. It, it's there are dependencies, governance, operations, discipline, continuous monitoring, and stuff. And it just doesn't stand alone. You need to have your asset management under control, configuration management, patch management, i.e. vulnerability management, and most importantly, user process machine identity management, as well as user process and machine access management. And many times in, in, the, in the security industries, we lump everything together. Oh, I have an IAM solution. Well, I tend to break it apart separately because you need to manage you identify and manage and keep track of all of your identities, your users, your inter-business system processes, and your machine access requests throughout your infrastructure. So that's identity management. Controlling the access is granting the access, separate and distinct from knowing the identity and the requester. So that's why I separate the idea of identity management as well as access management, and then the aspect of segmentation throughout your system. Given all this and your experiences and our experiences on all this, is there a cornerstone for all things zero trust? Well, always. And you know what? The references are out there. There's help in the reference architecture. Uh, DOD's trust, uh, zero trust reference architecture highlights the simplifying consistent policy, data management, and a focus on non-person identities as well as person identities. So the, the implementation of zero trust is highly dependent successfully on working with your business systems and applications people, as well as your, your infrastructure processes and control points of process to process access requests throughout your network, as well as person identities. I cannot highlight that enough. It's not just about users. Okay. It's about your systems and your access requests and sharing of information and gaining access to different infrastructure components. Do we have a reference architecture to help us get started on all this? Well, that's the good, good part. So between um, DOD, DHS, CISA, et cetera, everybody working together that are focused on first with DOD, the zero trust reference architecture maturity model, which is, is available to every one of your agencies. And what it outlines is not just a path, but what to expect at different levels of maturity from discovery assessment baseline. What does it mean to achieve uh, zero trust uh, in an intermediate stage or an advanced stage? 
So does this reference architecture give us a complete recipe? Well, you know, that is the challenge. It starts with, it's a reference architecture. It's not a physical implementation of zero trust. It's the architecture at which to design to, okay? Of what your components that you will bolt on and add on and use to, to achieve your zero trust posture. So the challenge there is always moving from concepts to reality. And again, the reference architecture provides um, pathways for that to follow as your models as you do this. Okay, so identity and access, data centric enterprises, control on your what they call your control plane, etc. From a design perspective, it, it does exist. So I would love to spend time digging into this with you today, but that today's briefing is a high level briefing. But the references do exist, and there are pathways to achieving this. All right, zero trust. Identities. You mentioned that the cornerstone is identities. What do we need to focus on with identities? Well, again, least privilege across users, systems, processes, networks, database applications, et cetera, your equipment and your devices. Um, again, just highlighting the idea that it, it, it's per request access. Turn it on, turn it off, right? So I've lived through, as I'm sure most of you have lived through, the idea of cor corporate or agency-wide access. You log into your, your, your laptop, it automatically logs you into your network, it logs you into all of your productivity tools, and it logs you into all of your business systems all at the same time. The big change here is, can you trust complete access to everything the moment you log on? What it really is about the... Um, her request is you need to log in when and be tested and authorized access when you need access to a business system. When your work is done, your session is done, not your day of work. When your session and your typing is done, log off automatically and then log in again. And I may seem like a pain in the butt because I have to keep logging in or what have you. But look at what's happening to our infrastructures in government and business all around the world. We're constantly under attack. This is all about not letting bad actors in or as much as possible, making it so difficult for them to get into your networks that they give up. So it sounds like in the background, what's happening is you're verifying and authenticating the user at the same time, they're also logging in from that device. So yes. the, the, there's a lot of authentication going on each and every time. So and a lot good. of it can be automated. It can be automated and tested, so it's not to be all manual, but it is a big shift from implicit. I trust everything. I, you're here, so I trust you to, I have to double check you at every stage. It's no different than when we used to walk into our office buildings and go right to the elevators and go upstairs. Well, a long time ago, we stopped. We started putting in a zero trust environment. So now today you go into most modern office buildings. What do you do? You have to have an ID badge and you have to have your identity checked that you're allowed to enter the building before you get to the elevator bank. Now extend that to your IT philosophy, to your IT systems. But Joe, this sounds as complicated as when you led the security for the Olympic Games. Well, in many ways, it could be considered that. Right now, I'm sure there are many people on the call today are familiar with the Project Management Institute and certification as a project manager, etc. Then if you if you have been certified as a project management professional, then you should recognize this formula. N times N minus one divided by two is the formula for complexity. How many communications channels among parties, et cetera. So when I was the when I served as the chief security officer for Atos, Atos has run in the past and continues to run the operations and infrastructures for the Olympic Games, summer, winter, and, and Pan Olympics. Now I had the great fortune to lead the cybersecurity planning, implementation, and operations for the Rio and Pyeongchang Olympics. And highly complex, lots of parties to communicate, the, the doping agencies, the athletic agencies, the governments, all the Olympic committees in every country, all the, 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 uh, the sub-sports teams, et cetera, the scorers, the referees, everything, food, 
um, access, multimedia at the games, uh, streaming live, text messages, communications for the athletes, lots of moving parts. That's the complexity here. Again, I, I wanna highlight that the complexity for achieving modernization in, in your federal agencies, as well as zero trust is not in the technology. The pieces of technologies to apply exist. It's about how do you do this and actually doing it and the communications process across all of the moving stakeholder parties in your security agencies. And of course, you're not just your agency, but other agencies. So I find the complexity to be more of a management and a performance management perspective rather than a technology complexity issue. Lots of parts to this, but it can be manageable is what you're saying. Yes, absolutely. And of course you have structures for managing your portfolio of programs and projects, et cetera. Uh, nothing changes from OMB, uh, you know, 53 and 300 reporting requirements. Again, lots of tracking, moving parts, keeping them all moving forward. And I'm guessing lots of performance management and reporting requirements too, Joe? Sure. So hey, guys, I'm sure you're all familiar, or oh, maybe not all familiar, but most of you are familiar from a program office perspective on your, 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 your planning for your budgets, et cetera, your investment summaries and tracking with OMB, reporting with earned value management and the templates you use for all of this reporting. Nothing else there has changed. So you've shared with us what's zero trust. You've shared us a scope, scale, complexity, the lots of moving parts. You've also shared with us that this is manageable like any complex project, you break it up into pieces. Sure. But from a funding perspective, how big is this thing? Well, I went out to take a look at the dashboard, OMB's dashboard for IT across all of the agencies, et cetera. Uh, and leading into this fiscal year that what's currently on the dashboard as of yesterday, as you know, across all your executive branches, uh, agencies, you're approaching $100 billion in total spend. So I took a look at, um, grossly across all agencies, not a breakout on, on individual agencies, on what the preliminary inputs for budget forecasts are. And what I've seen so far is it looks like that the budget increase to address modernization in total, including zero trust, uh, it looks like to me, it's like an additional $1.2 billion increase across all IT uh, funding requests. Uh, as reported or requested by agency by agency uh, with OMB. Now, OMB is also uh, directing everybody to use a technology management fund as, as much as possible and where that exists. Uh, and I've seen reports that are saying that it's looking like another 500 million may or may not be approved, but it's being requested to go in, you know, to be shared across the agencies in the technology modernization fund. But it will require from a planning and, and, a, and a portfolio management perspective to reprioritize how you use your IT funding within each agency. So this is very promising. It sounds like a a very long technology and security deficit is beginning to be addressed. Well, that is, that is the entire purpose of the executive order. Now, doing it is another challenge, right? So, and then budget requests don't necessarily equal budget funding, but that's what I'm seeing so far in the magnitude of effort across all the agencies. So, and if you think, you know, it's, well, if we're approaching a hundred billion already, what's one more billion? Let me tell you, you could do a lot with a billion dollars worth of funding. Okay. Exactly. So with all that, can you share some key takeaways from our discussion? You know, without belaboring it, okay. I'd like to leave you with this thought. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So if you look at all of the moving pieces, et cetera, it may seem like the challenge is so big. It will get you there. Again, the logistical complexity of planning this and the moving parts and doing the work, et cetera, it's there to be done. But the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Again, you cannot go out and buy zero trust at Walmart or at Home Depot or from any place else, okay? Um, and zero trust adoption will be unique to each of your agencies. There's, again, the guidance is there, the reference architecture is there, how you implement that, what tools you may pick under GSA guidance, et cetera. 
uh, who your cloud adopters are, how they're implementing zero trust on your behalf in their service offerings may be different and unique to your agency, but that's because of where your starting points are with your infrastructures and your business systems and the decisions that you make agency by agency. Okay, but you will find very common patterns on how to implement this as is already defined and provided by the reference architectures. So Joe, as we wrap this up uh, and before our third and last poll, where do we go from here? Well, you start by establishing your scope. Uh, do your inventories, uh, uh, you know, uh, inventory who all your users are. If you, you make sure that it's current and it doesn't change, all your, your processes, having a central store like a CMDB for all your your, your business system processes and inter-business system processes and communications, et cetera. That's the establishing of the scope. What are the tools that are implementing your security identity and access management that are in there already? Build your strategy and then build out a plan to adopt and implement over time. And it, you know, I looked at the timeline up front and said, hey, it's a, rel it's a long haul over a relatively short period of time, but it is years, right? but you got to start. Now, it sounds like before we undertake anything complex, we have to make sure that the foundation of our houses are secure. There's some basic cyber hygiene stuff that has to occur, like asset management, software updates, things like that, that are part of the scope. Yes. Okay, awesome. All right, um, Dave, I'm going to punt to you. Thank awesome. you so much, Joe. The third and final oh. poll. Fantastic, fantastic. All right, so... For the last one here, uh, what's next? If you want to like to continue the conversation, we're going to make sure that we we build that bridge to help you do that, and we're going to get to some of the questions while we're at it because there's a there's a bunch of them that were from the beginning as well. We want to make sure that we hit those um, and let everybody know how this works. Just pop it into the to the uh, hit the next slide if you would, Laszlo, and. Um, you can email, you can, you can send an email right to there or call that number if you want to take it offline, which is perfectly fine. We understand that. But if you have a Q&A for everybody else that you want to, you, you want, you need to, you think may, may be beneficial for everybody, pop it in that Q&A. We have one from Chris Graves. Uh, many of our applications in use include SAS, SAS through vendors. Will FedRAMP certification process be modified to encompass zero trust? The, yes. Yep. Yes, absolutely. There are very specific statements of guidance and deadlines over timelines for feedback, mm -hmm. commentary, et cetera, for not just zero trust, but the entire modernization effort under the executive order, mm -hmm. as well as the supply chain and software and supplier sides of modernization and zero trust, including updates and certifications in FedRAMP. Love it. Love it. So uh, we went through before, we, we pretty much defined ZTA, we think, right? I think we did a pretty good job of that and how it differs from traditional security. How do other functions like vulnerability management fit in? How to, op how to operationalize the idea of ZTA? Did, how, how close were we were on that for James? I think we are. Again, it is, it is there is a it ties into helping with vulnerability management and patch management, et cetera. So I think we covered those, at least at the highest level that we mm -hmm. could today in the time frame we have. I think the one I'd like to address separately is from Jeff. Uh, how does this differ from foreign partner nations? Yeah. I look at that as just another third party and another user or process connection point for zero trust. So you would look to extend just as you would zero trust adoption and verification of identities and access requests uh, to third parties, to any other, doesn't matter where the third party is, whether it's another nation, another agency, another military, whatever that may be that you partner with, zero trust is about knowing the identities beforehand and verifying them on a per request access basis. Yeah, right. That this extends downstream the entire supply chain. At the end of the day, we, you know, Joe talked about where we're identifying using least privilege each user for each access from each device. And we can even lock that down in theory by location as well. Is this user logging in from a known regular location? Things like that. But I'd like to highlight the difference in, in use of words between supply chain versus foreign partner nations. A foreign partner nation is not part of a 
supply chain per se, but it's a partner, it's an agency, another organization that you work with. It's a third party access. Okay. It Thank works. You for the clarifying same. that. Yes. Okay. Dave, uh, there are quite a few questions in the chat box. We want to open yep. that and go to them. Yeah, I'm going to get, I'll, I'll open that up in just one second. I do want to ask this was one that, that came in earlier from Terry from Department of Justice. Um, please address on premise to cloud hybrid architecture. Hang okay, on. I'm not sure what to address. However, as I mentioned earlier, ZTA uh, or achieving zero trust with your cloud suppliers, they have a mandate to achieve zero trust on your behalf. Regardless of where the access is being directed to or from, from an infrastructure, a devices, or business systems processes, it needs to be cohesive across your infrastructure and your cloud suppliers or your cloud access and servers and hosted business systems are just an extension of your network. So treating the access requests is the same. Now, at the administration end with your cloud suppliers and your software as a service suppliers and your platform as a service providers, to be able to sell to you you know, with the certification through FedRAMP and GSA authorization on your buy list, uh, they're required to meet the same things that you are being asked to in your agencies. All right. And um, Andrew is asking, uh, he has a late entry. How do you know when you got there? That's a great question. <laughs> well, that's the interesting <laughs> part. I could look at it and say, uh, you know, you got there when you have a complete inventory of all your person and non-person identities and that you allow access per request and you, you stop the access when their session is done. That's how you measure it. Now, achieving it is done over time, right? So the guidance within the executive order of OMB says, make as much progress as you can by September 30th uh, in 2020, fiscal year 2024. And if you can't get there and have MFA, I mean, the ability to say, can I measure having multi-factor authentication in place 100% for all my users and all my non-user identities, you can measure that, okay? Mm -hmm. um, you can measure your configuration. You know all of your devices. You can measure that and you can keep track of it. So I think you can know when you got there, but remember that it's identities and access control. If you offer a zero trust perspective, if you can say you have identified all of your processes, all your machine dependent interactions and all of your users and you track them in real time and you log every access and you control it, you got there. Awesome, fantastic. Karen Earl. I'm 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 opening it up so that you can uh, you can unmute and and you can chat with us. She had her hand raised from the beginning. She might have just wanted to say hi, but I don't know. But I have you uh, I have you ready if you want to chat or you want to just talk, Karen. If you if you have uh, the ability to talk, you can unmute yourself and that'd be great. And while you're doing that, <clears throat> Dominic was talking about how TIC 3.0 plays into facilitating zero trust for agency mission adoption. So that's interesting. I, what is TIC 3.0 and how does it how does it play into adoption? Well, I am not actually sure how FIT 3.0 fits exactly into this today, uh, but I'm very happy to take that offline and okay, come excellent. back to you with our opinion on that. Like that. And Darren saying for old timers, is there a correlation to previous initiatives for ZTA like DOD Rainbow Series? Love it. Well, sure. I mean, everything is about modernization and moving forward. And I understand trust, you know, with <laughs> the, the fiscal cycles in our federal government and the changes within administration and how that impacts your funding, et cetera. How do you get there? Right. Um, yes, there are parallels, of course. Sure. Uh, but the real question today is, you know, whether we appreciate it or not, I think most of you will or already do. But the world is a very challenging place. The bad actors are not going to stop. And the bad actors are not stopping because it's very easy money. Very little of the, 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 the return on investment for uh, cyber attacks and hacking and stealing your data and selling it 
is huge. It's a component of cyber warfare between nations today. Yes, it and is. until we make the drive away the return on investment that the bad actors are getting, they're going to continue to attack us. And it's escalating year over year. It's that simple. So uh, what makes this different? I think it's the imperative that uh, resulted in the executive order to say, we cannot deal with another solar winds. We cannot deal with another one of these major hacks like this. Um, it is crippling. And if we don't deal with it now, it, it is the, 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 you know, I did serve in the Navy. I rode around on nuclear submarines. I understand deterrence and I understand threats. And mm -hmm. I will tell you that from a, a, a posture of where we are today with cybersecurity threats today, this is the scariest error I think I've seen in my entire career. Mm -hmm. and, and Joe, I think you hit upon a very key word there, crippling, because with cyber warfare, the, the, the fronts have grown and shifted to include uh, systems of trust in the civilian population. You see attacks on healthcare and healthcare institution. You see attacks on the pharmaceuticals. You see attacks on financial institutions, education, et cetera. Mark? That's, that's awesome. And there are some questions about the slides and the recording. Yes, both of those will be shared. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about more that in a minute. Um, and Daryl's asking the question, would you, would you use this CISA ZTA pillar model as a reasonable starting point checklist to perform gap analysis activities? Great. Absolutely. Great that's why it's there. And that's why it's been, it's been published. Uh, it's been reviewed by DOD, et cetera, um, and adopted formally as a reference architecture for use by all the agencies. Yep. Um, and we have... Uh, Angela is asking, do you have an insight into when OMB will publish their final guidance? Actually, I've been looking and poking and, you know, it, 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 in September it went out for feedback and I haven't heard anything since. Right. Other well, than people are pumping it in into their budget requests right now. Yeah. And and we are seeing that. And Kip was saying it's a heck of a <laughs> it's a heck of an investment. Yes, it is. Oh, it is. It is. It is. And, and Karen Earl was saying it was an accident. She was just saying hi. Well, hi, Karen. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so uh, Devin had to drop off. Said it's excellent info though. So there you go. So you got props from that. And uh, same same with Kip. He has to drop. Um, and so we will. If you can go to the next one, Laszlo. Uh, you will get a recap at the end of the day. We will get you have the briefing presentation, all the handouts that are that are a part of this. I think there's some requests from, for some additional handouts or some different additional information mm -hmm. for some slides that that we will make sure gets gets circulated to everybody once we get them together. How about that, guys? So you have links to the session docs, which you will also populate right here because uh, Terry can put those in one more time, which you'll get the presentation and the docs that we were talking about earlier, but we'll send those out in a recap as well, a link to the video. And if you would like a one-on-one -on -one meeting with these, these guys and with Divine to help you uh, with your formulation, how much does it cost to talk to you guys if, if you just to, just to have a chat on with you about where the agencies are at the moment? How much does it cost? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. My All favorite. it is is a request to contact us, and we'd be very happy to talk to you. Absolutely. Free. My favorite four-letter word. How you like that, guys? All right, let's go to the last one, and we'll let folks off. If there's any additional questions, we will make sure that we keep, keep answering them. Um, here's Joe's information. Here's Laszlo's information. And if you need to contact Divine, you can check them out online at divine.com, as well as there's the, the main phone number to be able to reach out to those folks as well. And um, Dave, with that, quick, uh, yeah, go ahead. The, do you want to share the last poll results? Do I want to share the last poll results? I can. Give me one second. We have folks that would like, we have, we have so eight, eight folks that responded, which is fine. You know, we can take stuff offline as well. But there you go. There's there's folks that you're going to be talking to in the next few days or over the next 30 days, because that's what they told us they wanted from you. How you like that? Excellent. Yep. So so Wilbert has to drop. So we say goodbye to Wilbert. 
Uh, here we go. Sharon, how does telework impact zero trust goals? That's a, there's a question. Zero. Well, so telework and, and remote access fits directly into access requests in your network. So sure if does. you're doing telework work from home, your, your public internet connection from your home is actually extension of your agency's network. And it's the same thing. It, it just extends the identity uh, the uh, the user in the process, as well as the identity check and the access controls is the same. So actually it makes zero trust even more imperative. Yep. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. So uh, Darren's asked and said, cover S-A-S-E. Say that again. Cover S, so, so Darren is, is asking about S-A-S-E. Uh, Shantan who has to go, see you. Um, uh, S-A-S-E, Darren, could you be more specific about that? In fact, if you are- yeah, is, is, is Darren referring to the concept of secure access service edge by any chance? That's a great question. Let's find out. Darren, yep, yeah, we, that's it. That's okay. what he says. Yep. <laughs> yep. So why is that- many want... words Darren is, I'll say that. <laughs> Well, at, at, at the highest level, again, we would love to take this offline into deep dive discussion, but it, it, it merges the idea of network traffic with security priorities. So we, we talked about, especially in this age of the pandemic and what's going to be the next normal, um, you're looking at a lot of organizations that are saying, hey, our employees will continue to work remotely. So how does the public, you know, internet traffic as an extension of your network mm -hmm. you know how do you leverage security as part of the traffic that's now on the public internet so secure access ed you know i'm sorry secure access service edge incorporates all the principles of zero trust that we talked about gotcha and he's saying it's the jersey in me that's why he talks so much and uh and how it aligns with tick 3.0 and remote access i think that there's there's some other deep dives that you guys can talk about with some of these folks for for tick 3.0 remote access all those all, all those components and it, it, that's fantastic darren we'll make sure that we get that to you and we have reached the noon hour so we know that a lot of folks have to jump off now we will stay for as long as you like if you if you need to or at least at least for the next few minutes not necessarily as long as you like but uh, at least for the next few minutes to to continue asking and answering questions is fine with us uh, but we want to thank you for for your time yes, for being absolutely. with us today. Thank you very much, everybody, for for, for being here. We, it's our pleasure. And thank please you. feel free if you just want to reach out on an email to either Laszlo or myself. Uh, we'd welcome your to receive them and to respond to you. Yep, yep. And Andrew's saying uh, maybe we uh, say we should we regularly should be operating with the already breached mindset. Now I think that that's probably the best place best place to start sometimes assume a breach assume and you've I already been there. with that yeah and i i can tell you that if you're not the chances are you're you're just you got your head in the sand no, i mean one thing we can consistently refer to is the verizon data breach reports over the last 10 years Mm -hmm. The um, this one of the stats out of there that sticks out in my head constantly is, on average, a threat actor, uh, with all the people that are polled and surveyed that do report, are in the system for over two hundred days. Mm. That stat has That's never the come scariest down. piece. Yeah, um, and coming having a little bit of experience in the data breach remediation world in the past for me. It is amazing to me just how impactful those breaches can be. Um, and bad actors aren't going to stop. I think you said that. I mean, we can't just say, hey, guys, that's enough. It's, <laughs> they're not going to stop. And they're, they're ahead of us in many ways. Um, and that's just a fact. That's just a fact of the world. So that's the catch-up game we have to play in our federal, yep. federal agencies and government. Yep. So Darren's saying loss prevention has been around since the first caveman clubbed the other one to death trying to steal his food. <laughs> That's right, well, right? 
you, you actually hit home with that comment. So in, in our, you know, as Joe and I, you know, pre-pandemic, we're going around and speechifying. You know, I, I espouse that human nature itself has not changed in 10,000 years. It's the method of delivery. Yep. You know, we have better technology. We have better systems. We are better connected. Um, things are not any worse or not any better, to quote Joe. But what we have is better and more instantaneous delivery of whatever human nature is uh, predisposed to. Yep. Yeah, but yep. if you don't lock the doors or if you always leave the screen doors open, you know, you're inviting yourself to be attacked. Yep. Right. Yep. And I mean, I've always looked at it as if somebody wants in bad enough, they're going to get there somehow. It may take them a little while, but they're going to get there. And we got to, it's the ones Absolutely. that are jiggling the doorknob every 13 seconds that are, are saying, hey, is it still locked? Is it still locked? Well, as a city slicker, one of the things we learn when you park in the city is lock your car doors, regardless, because there are people that go through the parking garage. But at the end of the day, you know, be be cautious, be preventative. But locks are made for honest people. Yeah. <laughs> true words, true words, not been spoken. So uh, Travis says, I've received an update yesterday regarding a ransomware attack of a local hospital affecting our info. Yep, it's not going to stop, Travis. And the human condition is the problem. It's all the humans that are involved in this whole thing, Darren. Uh, well, so. what's interesting with that, you know, you, we've seen a, a specific rise in the stealing of healthcare and medical information over, especially the last three years. And threat actors um, purposefully stated that three years ago that they were going after that. Because if you look at on the dark web, you know, how much does a credit card number now go for? Less than a dollar. Mm -hmm. um, if you add the banking information, oh my goodness, look at all the breaches in the financial institutions and uh, that information that went out with, with one of the biggest breaches we've had with that type of information a few years ago, um, you're looking at an, a, a person's identity um, now going with, PH, with PII, with financial information, about $100 to $200 a record. If you add a full medical portfolio behind that, you are now seeing the rise in what's called synthetic identity fraud. And those records can go for eight to $900 per individual. Wow. Because you have enough information to mimic or replicate, hence synthetic identity fraud, that particular individual. And now add uh, the largest breaches we've seen from telecommunications. Um, uh, we can go onto the dark web right now, and for $15, I can um, hack your phone. The, uh, this is with the SS7 protocol um, in the cellular industry hasn't changed. And I can have the same text, unencrypted text messages replicate on my phone in real time. So that's an example of additional stuff you can find on the dark web. You know, our, our identities have been compromised a long time ago. A long time ago. And I, I did, when I did a, a presentation years ago, um, I just did a, a, a real quick count of how, where my, my personal information was, social security number and, and things like that. And I, I, start, I stopped at like 165 places. And I, because I, I started with my son who was just born. I was like, where is all his stuff? And it was like already like 26 places. And he was just born. And I've been around for, longer than just born yesterday. Um, so it, it is amazing to me just how, how pervasive just our identity information is out there. Um, and to your point, being able to do what we can, even so, to, to protect our systems, protect ourselves, and, and as a government, protecting the citizens of the, con of the country. And, and Darren says, a lot of state actors like to follow the money, I, you, know, you would think. <laughs> especially for R and D. Oh my goodness. Don't even start with that. So, so we're, I love that Darren. Awesome. I think, I think you guys and Darren need to have like a, like a Vulcan mind meld. Cause it sounds like you're all operating in the same, <laughs> in the same category. So we, we do appreciate that. All right. We're, we're, we're seven minutes after we appreciate you guys. There's still a bunch of folks here. If you have anything else that you'd like to discuss, I know folks are dropping, which is great. Uh, if you have anything else, uh, make sure you pop it in there. We'll make sure those answers get, answered or if you'd like to to reach out to these folks um, directly you can 
uh, all good. And you will get a follow-up. You get that recap email today. You'll get a finalized recap with a, with a video as well next week uh, with any updated information that we have for you. So we appreciate you guys being here. Gentlemen, Laszlo and Joe, awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much. And just as a last comment, I saw in the chat, somebody requested a slide for the information I talked about what the specific deliverables were. I will forward that to you, Dave, and you can get that out there. Yep. And uh, and we'll include that as well. So it'll be good. Awesome, Glad gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. And thank uh, you. don't be a stranger. All right. All right, guys. Awesome. Thank you.